All right, if you got your Bibles this morning, <clears throat> I want you to find John chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you'll give us great comfort in our hearts from these very words. They're familiar words. We know them. We've read them many, many times. Probably most of us could quote them. And so I pray that you'd show us something, give us something that's fresh and new and encouraging and comforting to our hearts this day. And we ask you to do it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Did you ever have a time in your Christian experience when everything just went wrong? You were cast down in your thoughts, in your hearts, in your expectations, in your anticipations of the future. Everything was just upside down and backwards. It was wrong. It wasn't right. Have you ever in your Christian life blundered so bad that there just didn't seem to be any way of recovery? Your whole world just crumpled and blew up around you? Well, there was a time just exactly like that in the Apostle Peter's life. And true to his own marvelous and wondrous grace, our Lord anticipated that very experience, <clears throat> and he provided Peter with the comfort that refreshed and restored his soul to gladness. And I think we can learn something from that very truth for out of our passage passage for today you know maybe that's not your case today the questions that I just ask maybe for you everything's rosy maybe you're just going down a primrose lane right now maybe life's just a big bowl of cherries things are going just the way it ought to be the way you'd like it to be but you know something could happen to change all that Something that you don't know, that you don't anticipate, you don't have a slightest idea about. So if everything is absolutely tops in your life and relationships and family today, pay close attention. So our thoughts for today might be a real help to you someday in the future, or maybe you know somebody right now today that's going through a real rough, difficult time something that's in their lives that make things just look awful grim. Well, there's real help for a troubled soul here in our scriptures. I think right here in the verses that we read, <coughs> excuse me, I think that there are two outstanding truths that are emphasized. One is the Father's house. It's a real physical house in a real, actual, physical place, heaven. Heaven's really real. 
Heaven's really up there. Heaven is just about 15 light years north of the North Star, but it's just a real place right up there. And then secondly, our Lord's personal return for his own. Let not your heart be troubled. You don't say that to somebody unless they're in trouble. You don't just walk up to somebody in a casual, ordinary conversation or talking about anything else and say, listen, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Don't let your heart be troubled. And so those words that we just read connect up with what just occurred in the last part of chapter 13. The Lord Jesus has been teaching and he's been telling and he's been kind of hinting, getting stronger and stronger and stronger in his words, that the disciples before very long, they were going to forsake him and they were going to just run away. He'd also told him that he was going to go away from them and for the time being, they couldn't go with him. Now look at chapter 13, verse 33. Chapter 13, verse 33. Little children, the Lord speaking, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. See, he was going home. He was going to the Father's house, and he was going to go home to God by way of the cross and resurrection, and they couldn't follow him just then. But he said, afterwards, they would follow him where he was going at a later time. Well, that didn't make any sense to Peter. He couldn't understand that at all. And he said in verse 36, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, whither, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me Afterwards, Peter saith unto him, Why cannot I follow thee now? I'll lay down my life for thee. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter, I'm going away. And pretty quick, you're going to throw me under the bus. You're going to deny me. You're going to sell me out for your own skin. Now see, the, the Lord is, is addressing all of these words to the disciples that are assembled together, but he's speaking directly to Peter. He said, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Man, speaking directly to Peter, to the very one that's going to deny him, not once, not twice, but three times in just a little while. Now, I think that we can find some comfort right here for our own hearts. Peter was indeed going to fail the Lord. But the Lord knew he was going to fail him. Deep in Peter's heart, there was a genuine and a fervent love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he said that he would lay down his life for him, he meant every single word of that. He just didn't realize how untrustworthy his own heart was. He didn't know of his own frailty. He did not understand the fallen spirit and the nature that is inside of every believer. It was a case of the spirit certainly being willing. But when the chips were down, the flesh was going to be weak. The flesh was going to fail. Let me ask you a question. Did you ever promise the Lord, I'm just not going to do that ever again, and then you did it? Well, the Savior knew the fearful and awful discouragement that would roll over Peter's soul when the realization came home to his heart that he had been so utterly faithless 
in that awful hour of the Savior's need. And the very, very time that the Lord Jesus needed somebody to stand up for him, be his witness, and just to say boldly, yeah, I know him. Absolutely, I know him. I'm one of his followers. I've been with him for three and a half years, and he's watched over me, and he has guided me, and he has fed me, and he has taught me, and he has instructed me. <clears throat> I'm one of his followers, all right, and I can tell you of the purity of his life. I can tell you of the goodness of all of his ways. And in that very hour when the chips were down, Peter, frightened by the soldiers, frightened by the words of that little girl, said, I don't know him. I never saw him before. I don't know anything about it. He absolutely denied any knowledge of the Savior. And then realizing what he had done, <clears throat> remorse just absolutely filling his heart and his mind, he stumbled out into the night, weeping and crying, tears just coursing down his cheeks, and the devil telling him over and over and over what an abject and utter and total failure he was. Well, the days and the nights that follow would surely find Peter just feeling that he must be cast off? That the Lord would never, never trust him again? Never use him? Never bless him? Never find a way for Peter to have any victory or success in his life or ministry or any of all that? But during that dark hour of his life, if he remembered the Savior's words, what a comfort and blessing they must have brought into his aching heart. Isn't the Lord Jesus practically saying, I know all about it, Peter. I know in advance that you're going to let me down. I know beforehand that you're going to fail. But I want you to know something. And I want you to listen to me with your ears. Up there in my father's house are many mansions, and one of them's yours. And you're going to share that with me one of these days. Peter, I will not allow that you will be entirely overcome. I will not permit you to go on into unbelief and into sin. I want you to see something that's just critical in verse 36. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Ah, there was no doubt about it, do you see? <clears throat> the Lord knew perfectly well that Peter was going to let him down. The Lord knew perfectly well that Peter was going to deny him. The Lord knew perfectly well all of the failures and the faults in Peter's life, but he said, you're going to be with me afterward. You're going to fall, but you're going to be lifted up again, and you're going to share with me that place in the house of many mansions. Listen, Christ not only saves us, beloved, but he sanctifies us <clears throat> and he keeps us. Listen, before he saved your soul... He knew all about the time that you'd let him down. He knew all about the time that you'd fail him. He knew all about the time that you would swear up and down, I'll never do that again, and then you would do it. He knew all about the time that temptation would overcome you, and you would let him down, and you'd find yourself in trouble, or in sin, or in discouragement, or some sort of doubt. He said to Peter, knowing full well that Peter was going to fail, he said, thou shalt be with me afterward. Your salvation in Jesus Christ is absolutely secure. It is safe. It is forever. When he said, let not your heart be troubled, he wasn't saying, oh, Peter, don't worry about your failures. He didn't say, think nothing of it. But he does say, don't be cast down in total discouragement when you find yourself in a place that you've let the Lord down. It's going to happen. <clears throat> 
I don't care how well-intentioned you are. <clears throat> I don't care how resolute you are in your life of service and, and belief. You're going to let the Lord down. And he said, don't be cast down in total discouragement. Don't believe that there is no further hope for you. Don't believe that there's no more opportunity to serve for you. Don't believe that there is no way ever again to be forgiven and cleansed and restored. I don't know, maybe I'm talking to somebody in the house. Under the strain of circumstances, maybe there was a time or is a time that you let the Lord down. Maybe you've heard or even hear in your ear right now the voice of the devil say, listen, well, it's all over for you. You've just gone too far this time. Christ might have claimed you once, but no more, you're done. I want to tell you right now that that is a lie from hell. The Lord's interest in every one of his children is just as deep as ever they were. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ loves you on your worst day every bit as much as he does on your best day. His love for you doesn't change. It is unfailing. It is eternal. It is always and is forever. On the very worst day you ever had, he loves you just as much as on the very best day that you ever, ever had. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, and if you have failed him, and if you grieve over your failure, that just proves that you're still his. Otherwise, you'd say, what's the difference? I don't care any longer. Those that can sin with absolutely no thought about their failures ought to examine their foundations if they really are a child of God. He waits for your confession and he promises complete cleansing and one day afterward you too will share a place in the Father's house. The man that says he doesn't have any sin has got an awful lot yet to live. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Same man wrote 1 John that wrote John. 1 John, just before Revelation, a little ways. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. You can find it. 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. Read verse 8 and just let it burn right into your thought. If... If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, <coughs> and the truth is not in us. Don't ever think that you got to the point that you've got it made, that you've hit it, that everything's rolling your way. But if you find yourself in a circumstance or a condition where you're under a burden of guilt, look at verse 9. Just take it to the Lord. You know what? You know, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. Catholics, amongst all of the people in the world, don't have as much phobia and don't have as much emotional unrest as other, as other people, and there's a reason for it. They go to the priest and they confess. Now, the priest can't do them any good, but since they don't know that, when the priest says, I forgive you, go do five Hail Marys or do whatever it is you do, they go away relieved. So what should a child of God do when you find yourself in a circumstance of sin and unbelief and failure? <laughs> Just do what the Catholic does. Go to the priest. Only go to our high priest, which is in heaven, and he really will forgive you, and he really will cleanse you. If, you forgive, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins <coughs> and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just go to the right priest. John chapter 14, go back there if you would, please. John chapter 14. Verse 1. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now, you know, long, long before the Lord Jesus Christ ever came to the earth as a member of the Jewish nations, the Jewish people had believed in God, even though they had certainly never seen him, except on the rare circumstances that he appeared to them in human form. But by and large, the Jews believed in God, even though they had never seen him. And the Lord is saying, now listen, you believed in God without seeing him, and I'm going away for a little while, and you're not going to see me either. But I want you to trust me in my absence, just as you do God right now when you can't see him, and trust me just like you when I'm gone, just exactly the same way you do now that I am here. <clears throat> you and I just need to have that sort of a complete confidence in him and realize that he's deeply interested in what we do and what we say. The psalmist said, Psalm 139, Bible says, he is acquainted with all your ways. Not just the good times, not just the happy times, not the victorious times. He knows when you're down and out. He knows when you're discouraged. He knows when you've got trouble. He knows all of every single detail of our lives. And what are we to do? According to Peter, we are to cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. There is nothing that does not concern God's people that doesn't concern God. He said, be careful, that is, full of cares. Be careful for nothing <clears throat> but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. He said, listen, you believe in God, believe also in me. Believe exactly in me, the, the same way, the same form, the same fashion, that you believe in God. Because I am God. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Beloved, that is, that's not just a big cobweb up there. Heaven's not just, you know, you'd get bored to death if you died and you went somewhere and you're sitting on a cloud and strumming a harp for the next 30, 40 million years. That'd be just, that's nothing. Heaven is a real, visible, physical place. It's a place where he's going. It's a place where the Lord has gone and someday he's going to take us right up there. No more sin, no more pain, no more darkness, no more sorrow, no discouragement, no failure, nobody sitting home because they're afraid they'll get the virus if they come to church, none of that stuff. It's all going to be gone. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And the word mansion there means a mansion. He was a carpenter. He knows exactly what a mansion is. So the Father's house is just a great big dwelling place with lots and lots of mansions. And there's an individual place for every single one of his own, and all in the Father's house. Listen, there's one up there with your name on the front door if you're a child of God. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know where your address is now, right down the road. Well, you've got one up there in heaven with your name right across the front door if you're, if you're a child of God. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. In very fact, you've got a glorious home beyond the skies. He said, and I'm going up there and I'm going to pre prepare an individual mansion just for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. Receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. You know what? The Lord's going to fulfill that promise. He's going to come back and get us. And we're going to get a glorified body, and we're going to be just like the Savior. Watch how Paul describes it in 1 Thessalonians. Turn over there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We were here just the other night if you were here on Wednesday evening, Bible study, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now watch. I mean, how clearer can this be? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4.
Look at verse 13. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, (coughs) concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Watch. He said, I'll receive you unto myself. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the coming that the Lord referred to in John chapter 14, and it's then that our completed redemption will be fulfilled. I want you to see something in Romans chapter 8. Turn back there. Romans chapter 8. Now, this may be something you don't recognize, don't realize, haven't thought about, but I want you to see it. Turn to Romans chapter 8. This has to do also with our completed salvation. Now, watch. Romans chapter 8. 19. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, the manifestation of the sons of God is when we are raptured. Now watch. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself, that's that's this world, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, now that's the creation, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now watch verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. You know, when you got saved, God the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of you. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of of the body. Notice that last phrase, the redemption of the body. When you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, your spirit, listen, you are body, soul, and spirit. You're a trinity. You're a tripart person, just like God is a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father is the soul of God. God the Son is the body of God. God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. God is a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. You are a trinity. You have a body, it's this thing. You have a soul, that's the thing inside of you that's listening to me right now. And you have a spirit. When you were born of your mama and daddy, your spirit was dead because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. Remember God said in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. They ate. Did they fall over dead? Physically, no, they did not die. But spiritually, they died. That's what broke the connection between God and man. When you got saved, your soul, which is you, Your soul is the real you. Your soul is the ego. Your soul is the id, if you want to talk to the shrinks. Your soul is that which, if you were lost, would be reunited with the body and go to hell. When you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, he made your spirit alive. Now you're able to communicate with God and to worship him and to love him and to adore him. And your soul got saved from going to hell. When people say, I got saved, their soul got saved from going to hell, and it's saved to go to heaven. Now listen to me. Your spirit was made alive. Your soul was saved. But nothing happened to your body when you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. It's still dying. 
And if you live long enough and get sick or get hit by a truck or a car or a bullet, you're going to go to bed with a shovel. You're going to go into the grave. Your body has not yet been redeemed. It has not yet been saved. Wages of sin is death. Your body is still dying because it's still sinful. Now with that thought, watch. Read verse 23 with me again. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's when you got saved. God the Holy Spirit moved into your body. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. So, our spirits have been quickened and made alive. We've already received the salvation of our souls, but we wait for the complete salvation of the body at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch how Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 3. Head over there. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Now get there and, read, and get, read the verse with me. Philippians 3, 20. 19. 20. Our conversation is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. When he comes to get us, <coughs> he's going to change your body. You're still going to look like you. No specks, though. No flat feet. No wrinkles. It'll be an absolute deathless, strong Healthy, no affliction, no sin, a real flesh and bones body just like yours is now, but glorified and immortal. He's going to change us. Your body has not yet been saved. Your spirit is alive, your soul is saved, you're going to heaven, but how would you like to spend eternity in that wreck you're living in right now? Huh? Wouldn't that be horrible? I don't think I'd care for that at all. Our bodies are not yet saved. We're waiting for the redemption of the body. Man. Okay, we've got to hurry. Notice now just a minute a word about the Father's house. It's the Father's house, and the Father's house is for all of the Father's children, not just the deeply spiritual, <coughs> not just the... <coughs> <clears throat> quietly reverent, not just the famous, not the preachers, not the teachers, not the evangelists, not just the missionaries, not just those people that have never failed the Lord Jesus Christ, but for everybody. There's a welcome for all of God's children at his house. No distinction up there in his life. People say, I've had people tell me, oh, preacher, if I could just get into heaven, if I could just get a seat behind the door, I'd be satisfied. I don't deserve any more than that. You don't deserve to get there at all. Not only deserving a place behind the door, I don't deserve to go there. But I ain't going there because I deserve to go. I'm going there because I have been born again. And I'm going there because the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing a place for me. And the Father's house is for all of the Father's children. And there ain't no seats behind the door anyhow. Rewards for our service are one thing. And our activity and glory is another thing. But the welcome home is the same for everybody. You remember the story of the prodigal son? Do you remember what kind of reception he got? That old man ran out there to me. He was a wreck. His t-shirt was all torn. That's all that he had left was a t-shirt. And it was all wrecked. His pants had holes in them. Looked like these modern jeans that the girls wear. Buy brand new at the store all ripped up and torn up. 
and he was filthy, and he was bruised, and he was hungry. And that old man just hugged him and kissed him and said, hey, listen, go get him new shoes. Get him a ring. Get him a robe. Go out there and kill the best calf we got. We are going to make an absolute feast because my boy's home. That's what kind of a reception and a welcome we're going to have when we get there. And then finally about the way there. Is everybody ever going to get to the Father's house? You know, I really wish that they would. Old Richard Baxter used to pray, Oh God, for a full heaven and an empty hell. But it ain't going to be that way. Because there are so many who persist in rebellion against God, that prayer can never be answered. There's just one way to get to the Father's house, just one. You know, and and I've heard heard people say over and over again, probably you have too, well, preacher, we're all traveling on different roads, but we're all going to get to heaven at last. But that's wrong. I don't find that in my Bible. My Bible says that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And my Bible warns me against taking the broad way because it leads me to destruction and it tells me to take the narrow way that leads to everlasting life. One more time, if you would, back to John 14. One more time, John 14. John 14, 4, and whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And then see what Thomas says, because uh, Thomas just said the way he felt, and he just blurted it out. And look what he said in verse 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? We don't know what you're talking about. We confess that we're ignorant about what you're saying. We don't know where you're going. <clears throat> Not only that, how in the world can we know the way to get there? So you just listen as he answers Thomas, because he's saying it to you just as much as he is to Thomas in verse 6. He said, Thomas, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And nobody can get there but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we need to tell people today, don't talk about lots of different ways to heaven. There's only one way, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. (coughs) And we need to ask people and to talk to people if they're trusting him, and if they are, then they're on their way to the Father's house, and you can wait with glad expectation for the hour of his return. He said, if I go, and he did... He's gone. He said, I'll come again, and he will, and receive you unto myself. And that includes every single one of his children, even if you've not been what you know you ought to be. We can just bring it to the Lord, and we can get it squared away, and we can bring a life of victory today, this very day. When's he coming? I don't know. I can't tell you. But we wait for him day by day by day. If you're not anxious for him to come back, listen to me. If you're not anxious for him to come back, maybe you're not ready for him to come back. If you're not anxious for him to come back, maybe you're not ready for him to come back. Are you ready? There's only one way to be ready. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by joining the church. No man cometh unto the Father except you get baptized. 
No man cometh unto the Father except you just get real religious and just be a real good person. See, there is no salvation in religion. Salvation is in a person. A person. Not something that you can do. Not something you have done. Salvation, you're going to heaven, rests on, relies on, a person. Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Are you ready? Father, I thank you for your mercies. I thank you for the Father's house. I thank you, Father, for the house that you've prepared for us. I thank you for fathers all around this world today. Dear Lord, <clears throat> we certainly see, we certainly see the grave situation that's true not just around the world, but right here in America. The big problem with families is they don't have fathers. They don't have fathers that lead, that guide, that instruct, that protect, that love. We don't have fathers that put their families first. And so the world's families, if you will, are filled with wives and mothers and children who don't have that caretaker that you intended for them to have. I pray that you'd put in the hearts and the minds of those who are fathers to return back to the job you gave them. I pray, my Father, you'll strengthen with great spiritual strength and understanding and unction those wives and mothers that have to play that double role, that you'll give them wisdom, that you'll give them understanding, that you'll give them strength to instruct and to lead and to guide and to raise their children in the right way. Father, I pray your blessing on fathers that are doing the job, and I pray you'd help them to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. You have just been listening to Pastor Ken Bates of Mesa Bible Church of Pueblo. We hope that this message was a blessing to you. If it was, please let us know. Send us a letter to 702 South Main Street, Pueblo, Colorado, 81004. As always, keep us in prayer and continue to watch our weekly broadcast. Thank you and God bless.